Welcome to Side Alpha Leadership, a podcast where leaders can share their experiences and discuss what leadership means to them. I'm your host, David Polikoff. Hello and welcome to this month's episode of Side Alpha Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, David Polikoff, and I'm pleased to have on the phone with me once again, uh, Jason Gardner. He was uh, on the show with me about a year ago, um, talked a little bit about, uh, actually talked a lot about humility. Um, it was a really successful uh, show and, and wanted to get him back, get his thoughts on some um, some new things that are that are rattling around in his head. And and, uh, and, and uh, without me rambling along like I tend to do, Jason, welcome back to the show. Thanks, David. It's great to be here. So tell everybody a little bit about yourself, um, you know, maybe a little bit about your, your background and, and uh, where you are today, and then we'll go right into uh, to our conversation. Yeah, great. So I, I did uh, 30 years in the SEAL teams. I'm a retired SEAL Master Chief, and I was a Command Master Chief of SEAL Team 5 and our training detachment before I got out. I retired two years ago, and I work with Echelon Front now as a leadership instructor, and we solve problems through leadership. So any problem that you're having is a leadership problem. And it may come down to how you're leading yourself. Actually, it does come down to how you're leading yourself. So you may ask yourself, well, I'm stuck in traffic. How is that a leadership problem? Well, obviously, you didn't plan for traffic. And you didn't give yourself a big enough window to move through it. And then maybe you're not having a good good enough success detaching from your emotions as you get frustrated in traffic but it's all leadership so there there you have it and uh you know for those that uh, that aren't familiar jason mentioned he works with echelon front he's been on the jocko podcast a handful of times so uh, giving out some good stuff um you can take back to jocko that we are now getting his energy drink here on the east coast it's at our wawa so we <laughs> we finally started getting that so uh it's actually not too bad and i'm not trying to plug his his thing i'm not a big energy drink kind of guy but it's nice to, to be able to have something that doesn't have all the uh the, the harsh stuff in it but uh, in it. exactly so with uh, with all that, and put that aside, and let's go ahead and, and talk about you know we want to talk a little bit about we we talked about online about parenting and uh, you know how your leadership um, the things you learned whether it be in the military or things that you've learned in the fire service or whatever walk of life you've come from and how we can tailor our leadership into being you know the best parents that we can be and that's what everybody strives for but maybe some of the things that uh that you've taken from you know raising some some smaller children and uh to where you are now and then we'll just see where the conversation goes to sure i i mean so honestly parenting is leadership at its most raw form because when you're parenting you're you're never off the clock And so when you're home all day and on weekends, your kids are watching you all the time and they're going to learn more from the example that you set than actually from the things that you say to them. And so they're going to learn more from how you interact with your spouse. They're going to learn more from how you behave when you're out in public. They're going to learn more from how, whether or not they see you complaining at home all these things they're picking up on, and so you have to be cognizant of it and very deliberate about it. And, you know, I've got a 25-year-old son, uh, a 10-year-old daughter, and a 9-year-old son as well, and I think I'm definitely doing better this second time around because I've been more conscious and more deliberate about my parenting style. It's, It's a really break that down. So... At Echelon Front, we talk about the four laws of combat, cover and move, simple, prioritize and execute, and decentralize command. And just to explain those really briefly, cover and move is really just about teamwork. It's about breaking down the silos at work and working together and developing those relationships. Simple is about articulating an, uh, an overall mission or goal and what winning looks like and ensuring that's communicated down to the lowest level. Prioritize and execute that is, is see, should seem pretty obvious. It's like, hey, you, you, you look at what you got laid out in front of you, and then you take each one by priority and knock it down one at a time. But in order to actually do that 
correctly, you need to be able to detach so that you're seeing the big picture and you know what, what the actual priorities are. And then finally, decentralized command. And that's the situation where every part of your organization has the first three laws of combat overlaid with each other. And then they're able to lead at their level because they understand what the why is. They understand what winning looks like. And then they're able to lead um, themselves in their part of the mission. So let me circle back around a cover and move. When we're parenting, you know, you, you and your spouse, and even if you're not in the same household, you need to be working together as, and not, and not against each other as you're, you're raising your kids. And then that all actually goes outside of your household too, because we all know that there comes a time when your kids are just going to turn you off and you're just going to sound, you know, you could be saying something to them that makes complete sense and they're just not going to listen because it's you, but they might be listening or they probably are listening to that teacher, that coach, that scout leader, that pastor, that, um, family member at aunt uncle or cousin and so it's important that you're all working together and you're all in the same sheet of music so they've got good influences on their lives so even though that maybe they're not listening to you they're listening to this other person and they're saying squared away things so it's important that you develop relationships with all these other adults that have influence on your kid's life so you can ensure that it's a good influence and it's squared away Second law of combat is simple, and that is, uh, you know, that's that's about keeping simple, but it's also about understanding what that overall mission or goal is and what winning looks like so that as you problem solve and as you're, you're doing, you, you know which direction you're going. So in, in our case, in, in our household, Iris and I, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, we, we, we had a discussion about what is, what is our simple for parenting? What is our overall end state and our goal for parenting? And uh, we decided after, after a good discussion about it that we want to raise kind, confident, competent adults. That's our end state, kind, confident, competent adults. And so now that we know that's where we're going, that's our goal, as we're problem solving as parents, that's really helpful to know. So, for instance, um, about about six months ago, my daughter climbs up an apple tree and then decides that she's stuck and starts crying. And as her father, I want to be her white knight and come rescue her out of the tree. Here's the thing. Me rescuing her is not making her a competent adult. No. So I've got to suppress that urge to rescue her. And I come over and calmly coach her down out of the tree is essentially I'm helping her navigate this obstacle that life's thrown against her. Cause I want to get my kids ready for the world. I don't want to get the kids, the world ready for my kids. Right. And, uh, and so that, that, that's what I'm looking to do there. And, and that, that, that's our end state. That's our simple, our second law of combat when it comes to parenting is, is, is raising, raising kind, confident, competent adults. The other thing that, you know, how, how do you raise kind children? The, you've got to set the example for them. You have to set the example and give them general corrections. But really, this is another one of those things that, that they're watching you 100 percent of the time. And they're seeing if you say derogatory things about people based on you know, maybe their physical shortcomings or whatever. They're seeing how you react in traffic and interact with people. And, and so that's the hardest thing of all, because that's on you to set the right example all the time. Uh, prioritize and execute third law of combat, you know, applying it to parenting. You know, you, you, there, there may be times if your kids are involved in sports and then you notice that their grades are starting to slip, that you have to sit down and say to yourself, well, what is the priority here? Is it school or is it soccer or football or whatever that sport is? And maybe, um, you know, maybe that, that sport's got to take 
a second priority as far as time goes to schooling to make sure their grades come up. Or maybe you find um, a compromise where you, 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 you know, you wind up hiring a tutor or something to make sure the kids have got good grades at the end of the day. And, and I think with at least high school athletics, if they kind of help you with that prioritizing and executing, if your kids' grades aren't up, they can't participate in, in sports anyway. But that's just, just another example. And then there's, you know, the other example of, of choosing your battles and what are, what are the hills that are worth dying on as far as parenting. And sometimes it's fine to let the kids stay up a little late. And, uh, um, as a reward, you can give them a little bit more screen time on their, uh, on their iPads or whatever, you know, electronic they're looking at. And finally, decentralized command. I mean, this is where we're all trying to get as parents is, is where your kids are making squared away decisions when you're not around. This is when, you know, your kids are showering and brushing their teeth without having to be told. And that, uh, when they're, they're faced with challenging, challenging decisions out there in the world that, uh, you've set them up for success by the example that you've set and all the guidance that you give them that they're, they're, they're making, making these good decisions and, and moving towards being, being a good, kind, confident, competent adult. The uh, and, and it's it's interesting and you know, listening to the, to the things that you were breaking down. I'm sure and I, I cannot be the only one. You know, a lot of the things that you're talking about is like, yep, that's that's my kids are that way. You know, my, my son's 13, my daughter's 16, and you know, you talk about you know your kids may not be listening to you. Um, I know. I know that it doesn't seem like my daughter listens to me, but I know she hears me. Um, so I think I find it important that I continue to talk to her and try to, to instill on in her what good values are. Um, obviously, we want our kids to be raised kind. Um, one of the things that you hit on that I think that uh, we're, we're seeing a lot, at least over here on the East Coast with the school, is uh, you know you want to make sure that all the adults that your kids come in contact with are sharing the same type of values that you are trying to instill in your kids. Um, we are very active when it comes to uh, what is being taught in our schools uh, what our kids are hearing. Um, we're fortunate that we get great feedback from our te- from our, our kids teachers as well as their guidance counselors. So we know what they're what they're learning in school. Um, I think that uh, you really as a parent, you have to uh, have an active role in their education. You have to see what they're doing. You just can't you know, send them off to school and hope that, uh, they're learning what they're supposed to be learning. Um, that's going to be on you if you don't, uh, actually take an active role in the screen time. I know, you know, we struggle with that at our house. You know, our kid, my, my son has an iPad, my daughter has a phone. Um, we want them to be able to have the freedom to look at their electronics and do stuff like that. But the, the, the going outside and the social interaction with friends and things, it has to take precedence. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, as parents, we struggle with, uh, you know, you come home from work. If, if I'm doing a 24-hour shift or my wife's doing a 12-hour shift, we're tired. And the easiest thing to do is, you know, they're watching TV or whatever. But sometimes you, you really have to, like you said, you have to set the example. You have to get off the couch. You have to, you know, even if you're tired, show your kids that there's more important things than the electronics. So it's pretty uh, sage advice that you're giving. And, and uh, again, um, it's hitting home with uh, the struggles that, that uh, you know, that I face with my kids, just kids are kids, um, that, uh, that you're bringing up. So keep going uh, with, with, uh, with some more stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so you know it's interesting that you talk about that, and I I think where you want to get to with your kids as they get older as well is that you start listening to them more, and then your dialogue with them includes earnest questions about things, and so you should get to the point. I'm fairly comfortable, for instance if they started teaching Marx, Marxism as a class at the school here, I don't, I don't want to completely shelter my kids from ideas, right? Because that doesn't work. 
But it, it, in fact, I, I think it would actually be helpful. Then you could say, well, then, then you could ask earnest questions about it. So if they've got, if they're, say their, their schools, and they have a class on Marx and mix them and they're, they, they've got a teacher that is, is very bent in that direction. And then, wow, this is a great opportunity now to have a discussion about how Marxism has worked out historically in the world um, to really dig into it and say, well, you know, maybe this is, is this f founded in some resentment and is that a good thing? And, and all those. So there's, there's these great opportunities for discussions. And then if you can get to the point where you're asking these earnest and, and, and maybe leading questions and then allow your kids to work through things, then the ideas and the concepts will stick a lot better. And, and I think when you look at it, the values that we have in this country that uh, about treating treat everyone with respect and just be a good person right and and give people as as much freedom is just it gives everybody freedom to do whatever they they want to do and as long as they're not really hurting anybody else um then it's okay and and i guess that can get into a whole other discussion but that's that's the conclusions that they're going to come to um, and so, so, but, but you've got to be aware about what they're being taught and you have to be an interested and involved parent. So, you know, to have those discussions, otherwise, you know, you can find that your kids are just going off in some strange directions that in, in the, at the end of the day, aren't productive. Yeah. I think that, uh, I think you, you hit upon something that's truly important. Uh, you know, the old saying that, uh, you need to learn history, especially where we have failed. You know, if you don't learn, then you're doomed to repeat. Um, and again, if, mm -hmm. if they're learning about socialism or Marxism, you know, you and I, as adults, we understand through history that it has never worked out in favor of the people. Uh, it works out maybe in favor of the few, um, but for your kids to understand that and you to understand that that's what's being said in school, like you said, you can have this conversation of, well, why do you think that this teacher feels that it's good and then point to the history of where it hasn't worked or what the fallacies were. And then that way, you know, if you're raising your kids to be critical thinkers, they should be able to look at it and say, yeah, it did work here. I hear what they're saying, but here's what history has shown. Um, and, you know, hopefully they can move forward being competent uh, young adults to say that, you know, yep, I understand what it is and this isn't for me or this isn't the values that I want to adopt. But I think if you just, you know, push your kids out at school and hope for the best, uh, you have no one to blame but yourself when they start to have a skewed ideology and you haven't been able to actually engage with what was going on and to be able to question as it goes forward. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you, you, may, you may come to a point where you and your kids, uh, you have different opinions and that's okay. It's okay. Yeah, to, I, to, to have different opinions and and that that that's okay too. And people generally their opinions evolve as they age. And uh, um, unfortunately, I think now folks will forget that it's okay to have different opinions and um, it, it and then polarize over it. And that isn't helpful. Uh, I see that happening. I, I don't know that it's any worse than it always has been, but uh, I just think it's something to, to watch out for. Yeah, I think that uh, it's probably been that way. I mean, even if you go back to the 60s when you had you know the, the hippie generation coming through and a lot of people didn't agree with that, it's always been there. I think that social media uh, and mass media has actually shined a bigger spotlight on it and you're hearing about it all the time. And you're right. It's okay to have different opinions. I had a captain I used to work for uh, when I was a young lieutenant. And he used to say, different isn't wrong. It's just different. And uh, I took that to heart. So, you know, there are things that my Whoa. kids agree with or that my kids 
think is right, and I might not agree with it, but I don't look down on them for it. I think that eventually, as they become more mature, more educated, they'll, their opinions will change, they'll craft. And even if they don't, it doesn't mean you're going to love your kids any less. Everybody's entitled to views and opinions. That's what makes this country great. We have that freedom. Um, what we yeah. need to make sure is that even though somebody thinks differently than you doesn't mean that they're a terrible person and that you can't be friends with them anymore. You can't talk to them or walk in the same uh, social groups as them. It it needs to be that uh, we all have the freedoms to think freely and uh, we need to respect that. And I think if we start to get that that respect towards each other, then uh, I I think you'll start to see a different light uh, of what we're seeing portrayed in, in the media now and not trying to get too political because that's the one thing I don't want the podcast to be as political. I want everybody to be able to, to share in this. But I think regardless of what your political uh, uh, views are, I think that uh, there's room for everybody. And uh, just because you don't agree with that person doesn't mean that that person's a horrible person and you have to, to hate, which is such a strong word. Um, I think we need to move away from that. Yeah, because if so, so think of it this way too. If there's no disagreement, there we, we'll never have any growth because we can't evolve. So let's just say that you and I are working at Blockbuster Video and we have the opportunity to buy Netflix, and we're like, yeah, no way. We're we're good. We're everyone comes to our stores every Friday. This is never going to end. And and then what happens? So so that's what's awesome is that when you're when you at least engage people in conversation that have different opinions or looking at doing things a different way then then you're able to evolve um and that is the danger i think now of social media as we wound up in these these little chambers where we're only hearing people that agree with us and then it's reinforcing our opinion and it, it it doesn't allow you to actually detach and look at look at things and say, well, is this, this really, is this really the best opinion or is this really the best way to do that? And I, I've come to the conclusion that I used to think that I knew everything. And now I realize that, that I, in every aspect, even the things that I think I know the most about, I have so much room to grow and I'll, I'll never scratch the surface on it. So, um, any opportunity to actually step back and, and look at things and like, well, is there a different way to do it is, is, is just an opportunity to grow. Yeah. I've, I've said, and, and I know I've heard, you know, you say it before on the various podcasts and, and uh, a lot of the people that are in this uh, leadership realm have said that, you know, sometimes you got to take yourself out of your comfort zone in order to grow. Um, we talk about putting each other, you know, in silos. If you if you just surround yourself with, with like people, then you're never going to get beyond what you are. Um, it's like mm-hmm. being the boss and surrounding yourself with yes men. Yeah, it might feel good for a while, but a- after a while, your company is going to suffer. You know, you are not going to grow because everything that you say, even if it's a horrible idea, everybody's going to talk about how great that is and and eventually your your company is going to suffer whether it be you know in the fire service your shift's going to suffer or in business your uh you know your 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 growth is going to suffer so i think that uh you have to be able to listen that's such a, a huge part of leadership is to be able to listen just because you're the boss doesn't mean you have to dominate the conversation you got to listen to what other people are saying because there are smart people out there that uh that may have good ideas or even better ideas and to be able to honestly listen and embrace that, I think, goes a long way. And I think that that's the same for the kids. You know, I try to hear what my kids have to say and, and uh, what they what they view things. And sometimes they see things differently than I see. And sometimes it's kind of interesting to uh, to actually see uh, or hear uh, what what they think something is versus what I think something is. It gives you a better perspective. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent agree with all, everything you just said. And, uh, you know, it's it's funny, you know, you talk about, you know, you want to empower your kids. You talked about your daughter, you know, being in that tree. And yeah, you could have thrown a ladder. You could have climbed up there and grabbed her and, and carried her down. But you made her 
make decisions to get down by listening to you. She conquered it herself. You know, I took my daughter out and, mm-hmm. uh, just the other day on the camper. We were working on the camper, and I said, hey, you know what? we got to put this uh, this bracket on the camper, so I'm going to give you the tools, and, and, and uh, here's the directions, and I need you to measure and do everything. And she was reluctant to do it because she's a 16-year-old kid, and she doesn't want to do stuff like that. But uh, when it was all said and yeah. done, she did the project perfectly. It was great. I recorded it and, you know, put it out on the Internet saying, you know, my daughter – you know, is, is, can do things that, you know, we, we may take for granted. Um, same thing with my son. Uh, he put together some lights for our back deck, uh, for my wife for her, uh, yep. mother's day. He did it all himself. I said, here's the plan. Here's the tools. I'll hold the other end. You do everything. He did it all himself. So I think when we empower our kids, they see us, you know, they see the actions that we do and how we interact with them and how we listen to them and how we talk. And, and I think all the things that you said is is 100% accurate. And I think that uh, we really need to start listening to our kids, paying attention to what they're doing, what they're learning in school. And I think that way we can help guide them to make good decisions and become productive adults in society. Yeah, yeah, heck yeah. I mean, and and then like we, you were just saying, um, you know, no growth happens inside the comfort zone and you got your daughter outside of her comfort zone and had her put on that bracket and she knocked it out of the park. And that, that's, a, that's a fantastic example of good parenting right there. Right. And, and, you know, following you on social media, I see the things that you do with, with your kids, you know, how, how they interact with the animals that you have on your farm and you're teaching your kids how to shoot and, and things like that. I, I think that all that stuff's important because that, that helps them grow as, as they move forward and they look back at their childhood and, you know, they can say, you know, dad was pretty cool. He, he taught me how to do all this stuff. So as they move forward in life, because you're not going to be with them forever, they're going to be self-sufficient and be able to figure things out. I think that teaching them how to think on their own is, is important. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what I wanted to, to get out there for people to hear uh, of, of, you know, with this conversation today. So anything else you want to add when it comes to, uh, to parenting? Uh, any more advice you want to throw out there, what you've learned along the way? Yeah. So we had a really tough life lesson happen here two days ago. Um, my wife was working one of the horses in the round pen, and uh, I was off I, – I was – kind of on the other side of the barn offloading um, lumber out of my truck. And and I heard a yell, and then I could see my son. I couldn't see the round pen where she was working the horse, and he was just frozen. And I hollered to him, Thor, what happened? And he didn't, he didn't move. He was still frozen. He was looking towards the round pen. I ran around the corner, and... Uh, my wife was standing there, the horse was standing still, and she said, Andor just killed Hank. And Andor's the horse. Hank is uh, our border collie that we've had since before kids are born. So 12 years, just beloved member of our family. And horse kicked him in the head because he would, you know, it stuck his head inside the round pan to, 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 to bark at him, which he does. It's a really bad habit. And... And it just, he wasn't moving. His eyes were open. I got hit with this just wave of nausea. I almost puked and I ran over there and we were just standing there looking at, uh, at Hank's just lifeless body, essentially eyes open, glazed over just still. So at least it was quick and the kids were there and then Hank started to flop and Iris told me, go, go get the gun. He's, he's not all the way dead. And so I ran up to where our cabin was and then he popped up and his head was just wrecked and he started running. Um, and it, it, it wasn't apparent that he could see very well and Iris was chasing him. And then he pulled a big arc across our property and was coming straight toward me. I called to him and he could hear me and, and, ran into my arms and I held him and then Iris was right behind him. And then she took him and I went inside and got the 22 and helped him ended his suffering. And it was, that's a, that's a rough lesson about life, but death is also, everybody's going to die and everything's going to die. And it's something that is hard for people to process 
Now, when you live on a farm, kids get a different, a, a better understanding of the cycle of life and, and what it means. But, uh, um, you know, that's what you sign up for with a dog, I guess, because they don't live, live as long as we do. And if you sign up for heartbreak and there's, there's a way to process it in a way, I think that that's healthy for the kids. It's healthy for them to, to cry. It's healthy for them to see me cry when, you know, we lose a, a, a loved member of the family. And so they, they, they saw the whole thing. And then when we went and laid him to rest up on 40 acres that we have behind right where we lived, they, they patted him and said goodbye to him. And, and it's, that's also a helpful way for them to process it as well. Um, and that's one of the toughest things about being a person is, is facing and dealing and processing with death. And, and this is something that in the fire service, you guys probably deal with it at least on a weekly basis and maybe more so if not then, but it's a, it, that's another discussion that um, is not a comfortable discussion to have with your children. And so oftentimes we, we don't have it. Uh, and then there's, there, there, there will be opportunities that, that come up and, and it's, 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 a, it's important to talk to your kids about it and what it means. And, uh, and there you have it. Yeah. It's, it's that particular subject, you know, whether it be, you know, a, a family member or, or a pet in the family is it, there's no, I don't think there's any easier, correct way. Um, you know, my wife being a hospice nurse, you know, she's, got a lot of mm-hmm. the classes that she's had to take and, and the, the grieving pr- process, you know, they, they say, you know, the man is strong and, and you know, can't show emotion. That's a hundred percent false. Uh, you have to show the emotion. You, you, it lets your kids know that you're human. It also lets them know that it's okay to be sad. It's okay to cry. Mm-hmm. It's okay. It's part of processing it. And, and, uh, you know, death is a subject that it's, it's difficult, but, uh, you know, in my line of work, obviously, we, we deal with it quite a bit, whether it be, you know, the civilians that we run um, of all various ages or even, you know, the firefighters that, that passed away. You know, a friend of ours who is a firefighter just passed away a few days ago and his funerals this weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, it's not an easy subject, but it is a subject that uh, you will eventually have to have with your kids. Um, like you said, death is, is a part of life. Um so, um, uh, sorry, sorry for your dog. You know, I read that on, on your page and, and, uh, I know it's not easy. Um, we have two cats and a dog and, uh, I know that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, eventually that, that t- subject is going to, to happen. So sorry for your loss there. You know, a good animal. I, I've said it Thank many, you. many times. I'd rather, I'd rather hang out with my animals than most people. <laughs> <'Cause>, uh, <laughs> animals are cool. Sometimes yeah. people just suck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So well, let's go ahead and, and we'll, we'll finish off the, this, uh, the last half hour of the show, you know, kind of segues into what we just kind of ended with, with uh, life and death is, you know, talking about taking care of yourself and, and how that helps you become, you know, a stronger parent, a stronger leader um, for yourself, for your spouse, for your kids, for your, your workmates. Um, you know, I know that's what we wanted to talk about. Um, so I think it's a good segue into taking care of yourself. Sure. I mean, all all this leadership starts with you. And so individually, you know, being the best people we can be involves number one, being healthy and, and so that you're in a good cognitive state so you can make decisions and that you're not reactive and just ruled by your emotions. And one thing that, that science is indicating to us more so now or, or very much so now it, that's, that's really important is, is sleep. And uh, I think the fire service is kind of like the SEAL teams where we prided ourselves on getting by with less sleep and and still trying to perform and the data indicates that if you're not getting enough sleep you're cognitively impaired 
Uh, we found in the SEAL teams that we had a myriad of health issues. Uh, one of them was like, you know, 27 year old guys with the testosterone levels of a 13 year old girl. And when they dug into it, they found it was just, the sleep was completely off. Um, when I came back from my 2009 deployment, I was uh, addicted to Ambien. And so the sleep that I was getting really wasn't sleep. It was sedation. I wasn't getting into those deeper levels of so stage three and four sleep where, you know, your body does all your detoxification and it's uh, fixing, you know, you know, making all your good hormones and all that testosterone is one of them. And, uh, and I was lucky that our diving medical officer had just come to that realization and started helping everyone get serious about their sleep um, and, uh, and, and helping guys use natural supplements like magnesium and kava kava and things like that to get off of the Ambien and the other sleep aids because it's just super, super bad for you, as is uh, alcohol. Um, you know, if you have two drinks with dinner, you've just blown your sleep architecture out of the water. And so it's something that you need to be cognizant of is that when you're, you know, if you're going to partake in, in adult beverages that just know that that's, Hey, maybe you should just moderate it to a couple days a week. Cause otherwise it's throwing your sleep off. And the downstream effects of that is lower testosterone and, uh, uh, lesser ability to deal with, you know, emotional stress and things like that. If you're not getting enough sleep, your body will not metabolize fat. It won't do it. It's stressed out. It thinks that there's an issue and it's going to hold on to your fat reserves so that, uh, um, you know, you have it when you need it later on. There's a great, there's a great book by uh, Matthew Walker, uh, Why We Sleep. And then it covers this stuff. And, and when the book came out, he went, you know, on all the, the health podcasts, Peter Atia, Rhonda Patrick, I think he was even on Rogan. And uh, that really opened my eyes to it. But since that, those experiences back in 2009 and 2010, specifically when I started fixing my sleep, and then I got really disciplined about my sleep, I, my, my, my health has gotten exponentially better. And, you know, there, there used to be three different medic medications that I was taking daily, and I'm not taking any medications daily anymore um, because, because I've gotten disciplined about my sleep, you know. And so what, what does that look like? That, that, that means that uh, I, I'm not having any caffeine after noon. Um, I'm not having more than, well, I quit drinking, but you know, it, it could look, look like for you, like you only have one drink with dinner and that, uh, you've got all the lights off in, in your house and that you're disciplined about it and trying to get that six or seven hours of sleep, which, you know what, this is difficult when you have shift work and it, it, it means that you've got to be even more disciplined about the sleep that you do get. Yeah, we, uh, you know, where I work, we work 24 on, 48 off. And, uh, you know, we, mm -hmm. we show up for work. Uh, work starts at 7. Most guys get to work around 5, 5.30, uh, get our day set up. And, and then we're pretty much go. You know, we work out. We, we do our best to work out uh, at least for an hour, hour and a half uh, in the weight room or some type of cardio training. And then and then uh, we you know, we get showered up. We start our day or my guys start their day. And, uh, you know, they're running various calls throughout the day adding on to the stress levels and things like that. One thing I can say is that, you know, in the in the 30 plus years I've been on the job, the eating habits have gotten a lot better. Uh, the food is not the junk food anymore. People are actually uh, cooking better food, um, staying away from a lot of carb laden stuff. Um, and then when it's time to go to bed, most guys are in bed by 10, 11 o'clock at the latest. Um, unfortunately, you can't control the 911 calls that come in. Uh, I would say that mm -hmm. our sleep isn't the greatest. You know, we're sleeping in a strange bed. You know, if you're used to sleeping in a king size bed, you're sleeping in a twin bed with, uh, you know, 10, 12 other dudes uh, in, in the bunk room with you. Um, but uh, the sleep is broken at best, but uh, you have to be able to go home 
and like you said, discipline yourself in order to get that seven to eight hours of decent sleep. Even if you have kids, unfortunately, my kids are my kids are teenagers now. They're they're getting they'll sleep thirteen hours if I let them. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, the drinking again, you know, I, my wife and I don't drink that much. I think I can count on one hand how many drinks I have in a year. Um, but, uh, you know, a cup of coffee in the morning, we stay away from the caffeine. We don't drink sodas. Uh, my wife doesn't process caffeine very well, so she doesn't even drink coffee. Mm-hmm. So, um, we're fortunate in that aspect. The other thing is screen time, especially when we're talking about the kids, uh, having that screen in front of their face at nine o'clock, all the screens are turned off. Uh, a little bit of TV mm-hmm. before you go to mm-hmm. bed, but none of the computer stuff, none of the phones or anything like that. So yes, the sleep is important. Eat good eating habits are important. You talked about your metabolism will will start to to uh, slow down if you don't get that sleep, and then the, that heavy dinner that you ate, well, your body's not going to metabolize that. It's going to grab all that fat and hold on to it, and you'll start to see yourself gaining weight. Um, and then you know, as you get into your your middle age, you know, your 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 late forties and fifties, it's very difficult to lose that weight. You have to work twice as hard just to, to lose that weight. Your testosterone levels go down. You're tired all the time, but then you're not getting the sleep that you're supposed to be getting. It's that that vicious cycle. So, I think that uh, uh, excellent advice. And I know when you had talked about uh, you know your sleep issues of of you know, that adrenaline rush 24-7, you know, for months and months and months being o- over, uh, you know, in Afghanistan um, and that, that high level of, of awareness at all times, that crash when you come home, uh, I can't imagine what it would be like to try to adjust back to that. And, and obviously you eventually figured it out with some help from other team members, but uh, good advice. Moving forward with uh, the taking care of yourself, I know you guys are big on working out. Um, want to talk a little bit about that of what your day might look like. I know working on a farm, you get your workout even when you don't even know you're working out. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's the key, really, is if you can get your exercise from outside doing something or what's even better, it, it's better for your mind, too, is is play, like playing some kind of sport so you're really stealing a workout. That that is uh, the the ideal situation, you know. For me right now, what we're doing is uh, a lot of body weight stuff. Um, you know, I've gotten into yoga to increase my flexibility and just deal with some of the the inflammation and the pain that I've got going on, which which has been been huge there. And then I've gotten away from it, but I need to get back to it. Is just knocking out some deadlifts and doing some sprinting. Um, and some, you know, type of explosive movement things to stay, to stay in shape, you know? And, and then, then I, I like to think of it, like we talk about general health is like the sleep is your foundation. And then you have the pillars of, of diet and exercise that sit on top of that foundation. And, and I, it's interesting what you said about like knocking out the screen time, because the the blue light is tricking your brain into thinking that it's 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 daytime and and then you're producing the cortisol that's keeping you awake and it throws off that whole circadian rhythm that you've got going on the inside uh, but it's the a lot of you guys you know that were you know either in special operations the special forces seal teams and whatnot I'm telling the the listeners now, you know, if you, if you follow these guys on Instagram, uh, especially like Pat McNamara, he always puts his workouts, you know, listening to the really good heavy metal music and puts his workouts out there. You know, he's, uh, you know, I believe he's, he's my, my age. He's at least in his early 50s. Um, he's in great shape. And uh, to be able to, you know, mimic those driveway type uh you know you don't have to go and join an expensive gym pay hundreds of dollars a month where you can just do stuff Mm -hmm. around the house like you said if you play softball or baseball or something like that if you still play soccer um go jogging treadmill bike free weights whatever it is uh you have to take care of your body especially as you get older um you start to lose that flexibility you know you know I can only imagine the aches and pains you have uh, being, you know, in the SEAL teams for, for 30 years. Um, it, it Even the aches and pains that I feel now uh, from being in the fire service for 30 years, I tell my wife the day that I wake up not in pain from something, I'm probably dead. 
um, because we're always <laughs> constantly, there's yeah. always a joint pain or something like that. I remember waking up one morning mm-hmm. the day after Christmas with a stiff neck, and that ended up being uh, a, in the C4 spine. I had an inflammation uh, of one of my discs, and everybody's like, oh, did you oh. do that on the job? I'm like, probably from 30 years of doing the things that I do. I just, I woke up one morning, and next thing you know, four days later, I'm in the hospital, but uh you know, you, you have to take care of yourself, uh, especially when you're talking about retirement, um, where you're not getting that exercise anymore. You, you have to make that conscious effort to, to eat right, to get the decent sleep and, and to exercise if you want to enjoy the retirement that uh, you worked hard for. You know, I, I see so many of, of my friends that have been retired for 12, 13 years and then they pass away. Um, you know, you, mm-hmm. they did 30 years in the fire service and they only got 15 years of retirement. That That's not fair. And, uh, you know, my no. kids are relatively young. I want to I want to see them get married. I want to see them have kids and whatnot. So you really have to take care of yourself. Yeah, I it, it, you know what that I, I absolutely love um, Pat McNamara's Internet presence and the stuff that he posts. Uh, on social media is fantastic, especially Wednesdays with yes. basic food stuff. <laughs> and I love the dichotomy between a, you know, like he, he's lifting weights, and then b, you see him cleaning, and then c, he's bird watching, and then you know he's gardening or something like that. And he's I, he really does a great job of breaking the stereotype of what it means to be. Uh, like a high energy go getting man and the and and I think there there are some negative stereotypes that people have and negative negative uh, images and and he's carving it back in the right direction which is uh, uh, it's really refreshing to see the stuff that he posts and uh, I really enjoy it. Yeah, my son and I we watched the basic dude's tough Wednesday. I actually got the t-shirt I, I sent out and uh, <laughs> got a t-shirt from him, but uh every now and then I'll send yeah. him a video of my kids doing something and and uh I think the last video when my daughter put the bracket on, I sent it to him. I said uh you know, helping dad put a bracket on the on your camper is and she said like, basic girl stuff. <laughs> and uh-huh. and sent it to him and he gave me the thumbs up, you know. It, it's it's pretty yeah. refreshing to see that, and, my, and I make my wife watch it all the time, especially when he gets his wife involved. It's pretty funny, but you're right. He's yeah. breaking that stereotype of what a what a, a, a man is supposed to be, of, you know, of whether he was a, a special force operator or a special operator or in the fire service. You know, it's okay to let your guard down. It's okay to enjoy stuff. You know, I help my wife. You know, she has a nice flower garden. I help her make sure that it looks good and cut the grass and, you know, help her weed or whatever it is that we do, um, you know, enjoy nature, things like that. So, yeah, I think that uh, yeah. all, all of that is part of taking care of yourself. And and I think that also shows the kids that, hey, it's okay to be a well-rounded, you know, man. You don't have to be this tough, uh, you know, gruff looking uh person who who doesn't interact with with uh with nature and things like that it's okay to be well rounded matter of fact it's it's more beneficial to be well rounded mm-hmm. and, and that's another example of that first law of combat cover and move where you're using pat as another example for your kids you know and and so the the social media thing it's 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 a real double edged sword, isn't it? Because it has some negative connotations and it's got some great connotations. And I, I, I tell you with like my oldest boy who also follows Pat and I love it when I see him, you know, liking it. Cause I'm like, okay, cool. Here's another great, here, here's somebody that's a great example and is a great influence on my son's life. And, uh, um, it, it's it, it's good. There's a lot of positive out, uh, stuff out there, and, and if you can push the focus more towards the positive than some of the negative things, and shoot, what a great tool it is. Yeah, there, there is some good stuff on the Internet. I mean, it's not all terrible. There is some good stuff on there. You know, I, I uh, you know, like I said, I listen to the Jocko podcast, and, and 
a lot of the things he talks about, you know, even with, with the military stuff, there's there's lessons to be learned from that. Even if you never did time in the military, uh, it's lessons uh-huh. that you guys learned along the way that you can uh, impose in life. And as a matter of fact, that's what you guys do with Echelon Front. You don't go around to military bases and teach people this. You go to, you know, Fortune 500 companies with, you know, people in suit and ties that, that uh, probably have never held a weapon in their life. And you give them these, uh, you know, ways of looking at things and how to enhance their their companies and how to break out of their comfort zone and how to you know you know listen as well as to talk and and and, uh how to uh you know be a better leader and and i think that's what it's all about and and i've enjoyed following you know all these guys that uh came from a different walk of life you know all i've ever known is the fire service but to see that there's other stuff out there um and then apply that to how you know, I do my things is, uh, it, it, again, it takes me out of my comfort zone and it, I think it grows me as a person. And I think that it helps my kids see that, you know, it's okay to do different things. It's okay to do things that maybe you are a little scary or maybe uh, you might not uh, succeed right away, but over time you'll get good at it. And I think that, uh, you know, that's that's one of the, the stumbling blocks that I had um, as my kids grew up when, when, you know, my son was playing baseball and after a couple of years, like it's boring, I don't want to do it anymore. And I let him stop, you know, same thing with my daughter. She played soccer for a few years and I don't want to do it anymore. I let him stop. And, uh, I think I'm doing my kids a disservice by allowing them to just quit because they didn't, they, they think they didn't like it, or maybe they weren't good at it as opposed to sticking it out. Now my son's back into karate and I told him I said you know you're in karate now and you're 13 so I've got you till you're 18 years old you are not going to stop I guarantee you that and uh so that's where we are right now and and um he's doing well at it so I think that uh, again nice. like you talked about setting the example you know whether it be setting the example for your kids setting an example you know for, with your spouse or even with your coworkers um you know try your best to do the right thing when people are watching, but more importantly, do the right thing even when people aren't watching, because then that means you're genuine. Yeah, absolutely. And and we get a question a lot on uh, at Echelon Front where we're talking about leadership, and people are curious, like you know, well, how do I influence my peers? And um, you know, there there's my other the uh, my department's doing good but this other department or this other team they're not taking ownership how do i get them to take ownership and the answer is is by your example and if you want to influence your peers you have to allow them to influence you and you have to develop relationships with them and it what's what's great is this opportunity that i've got to go and work with all these different organizations and i find out that the, the the issues that we had in the SEAL teams are the same issues that you guys have in the fire service, and they're the same issues that, for the most part, that people have in um, in like a software company or a health work company. In and 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 I'm talking specifically about the issues in dealing with other people and working with folks and leading and being led. It's all the same issues. It doesn't matter what organization you're in. Um, Sure, there are aspects of it that are a little bit different when it's, you know, when we're talking about like going into harm's way, like you would be fighting a fire or us going over and, and, and being involved in armed conflict. Uh, but all those interpersonal relationship issues and dealing with people and, and leading and being influenced and influencing, it's all the same no matter where you go. Yeah, it's it's funny when I you know when we teach we go up up and down the East Coast and out in the Midwest and we teach various other fire departments and you really sit down and you start talking to these guys the same problems that they're having in Kansas is the same problems we're having here in Maryland when it comes to the fire service and the calls that we're running talking to people over in, in England you know listening to you know how the things that they bump up against in the fire service is the exact same stuff that we're bumping up over here in the States. So 
you know, mm-hmm. I, it, and like you said, it transcends. It's not just what you find in the military. Um, you go to a Fortune 500 company, they're having the same problems, you know, getting their people motivated or getting their people to move in the right direction or to, you know, where you may have the boss that is not listening to what his people are saying. And, and you know, we have the same problem in the fire service where the, the chief might not be hearing what the people on the floor are saying and, and to be able to, to kind of, you know, take a step back and say, okay, talk to me, tell me what's going on, what's the problem, and and being able to listen. And like you said, building these relationships uh, as you move forward, um, that enhances your leadership credibility. And and I think that uh, you'll see the company start to move forward. I do think that some inherent competition uh, within departments uh, makes you better, um, as long as it's friendly competition and not destructive type. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think that when, you know, I tell everybody, you know, the battalion that I work in, obviously, hands down, is, is the best battalion. And, and I'll get officers that come from other battalions that work. And at the end of the shift, I'll look at them. I said, look, I don't want you going back and, and, and punching all your guys in the face. And they just kind of laugh and say, why? I said, well, now that you've worked in the best battalion and seeing how it's supposed to be, and now you're going to go back to your <laughs> battalion and see how the, you're not living up to what we are. You know, it's all tongue in cheek. But that, that friendly competition yeah. makes you better. It strives you to be better. Mm-hmm. And I think that that uh, I think that when you challenge your people, when you challenge your kids, it's amazing how they rise up to the bar. That's we're learning that as we go. My wife and I as parents, as we we challenge our kids in school, it's like, hey, I think you're really doing well in this class. Uh, let's talk to the guidance counselor about moving up to an honors class. And and you can see the, the panic in their eyes is to think that the work's going to be so much harder. But we found that as we raise the bar up, they meet it. And, uh, you know, even with this mm-hmm. pandemic, this is the worst school year ever um, where they spent more time at home. Uh, my kids made the honor roll. You know, I can't be any more prouder than that. Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, you, you far exceeded what we thought you, you would do based on what you were missing in school. And, and they met it. They met the, they, they met the bar and, and uh, they're doing well. So I think that when you challenge people, when you, when you build these relationships, I, I think that uh, you'll find that, that business moves a lot smoother, especially when uh, you start realizing you're not bumping up to the problems that you have been in the past. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, well, we're coming down to the uh, to the witching hour, as I like to say. And um, you know, before we sign off, is there any any parting words that you want to put out there? Anything that's coming up in your world that uh, that uh, we should tune into, uh, whether it be on your social media or through Echelon Front or anything like that? Nope, uh, just trying to 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 get better and uh, um, learn and evolve. And uh, you know the the parting thing that I just want everybody to think about is, is as you go through the day, be kind. It takes the greatest strength to be kind, be kind to yourself, be kind to your family, be kind to the planet. And that's it. All right. Thank you. Well, Jason, I appreciate you being on here again and, uh, Look forward to uh, this show coming out. It'll be out uh, August 1st, uh, which is uh, a little less than a month from now. And uh, um, for those of you that don't, you can follow Jason on Instagram. Also, his wife Iris is on Instagram. I would uh, suggest you follow them as well. Between the two of them, they pull out some really good content. Um, And just to kind of see what's... Go ahead. Yeah, Iris is is by far and away got way better content than I do. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and you can follow her at all the wild places on Instagram. And I'm at jason.n.gardner on Instagram, but definitely make sure you're following Iris because she, she puts out things that are really thoughtful and really beautiful and will make you better. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that the, the women in our lives look at things a little differently than, than we look at. And they, they always tend to see, the good uh, that's out there as opposed to seeing the negative, which we sometimes get wrapped up in. So with that, Jason, thanks for being on the show and uh, take care of yourself and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Thanks, David. Have a good one.